TLO, what's poppin'? We are on Twitch. We are not live. But you can leave a like, comment, subscribe, turn on your post notification bells. Let's continue to grow the family from Chicago to the UK. Benordum, 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 Benordum. Chill. I know it's a late start today. I got y'all. Right after this video, Benordum's coming. So make sure you like this video. First responders, tell them. Like the video. Uh, don't forget we are a spot, uh, not sponsored. We are partnered with the Blueprint Mastermind, man. Link down in the description. This is the latest roundtable talk. And this is where all my old videos are. They'll be back up this March. Don't forget we got the Patreon. Link down in the description. And we got Discord. Link down in the description as well. We trying to get the Discord back. Bussing. Bussing, bussing, bussing. Anyway, man, this is for Ben Pearson's page. Uh, the job that broke me. Retired police interceptor. Oh, yeah, I did. Did y'all tell me this existed? This got to be some of the most fire sh that I ever seen right here. Yeah, 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 yeah. I can't wait. <laughs> ben, you got to understand. You see my title? Chicago Dude Reacts. You know where I'm coming from, Big and So, no matter of fact, simple. Let's get into it, man. I've been waiting for this all day, low-key. The job that broke me. Uh, I'm Ben Pearson. I've retired after 19 years in West Yorkshire Place. 19 years is crazy. Part of the Rods Policing Group, the traffic cops, what everyone knows as is. Um, and I filmed... Policing it's episode on Channel 5 for about three years, two and a half, three years, somewhere around there. My career's ended because I've been diagnosed with post-traumatic stress disorder, severe depression, anxiety. This is due to the level of um, crap, basically, that with post-traumatic stress disorder. PTSD? I got PTSD just from living in Chicago, and I, I did that for free. No paycheck or nothing, no pension, nothing. Just, <laughs> just did it. Just severe depression, anxiety. Messed up. This is due to the level of um, crap, basically, that we've been put through and what we've seen and done. People think that the the job is sitting on a, a roll road, doing Mr. Miggins at fifty three in a, a fifty zone, and it's, it's not. The job itself, um, it's, I'll go into it in a few more minutes, but it's a complex job of what you do. It's the best job you could ever think of doing. Don't get me wrong, I think I'll... I beg to differ. You gotta wanna be a police officer to be a police officer. Like, you can't just pick up one day like, oh man, this is the best. Nah, I don't know. Like, you wanted that for like a long time. Which I believe. kids want to be either an astronaut or race car driver. Don't get me wrong, I think all little kids want to be either an astronaut or race car driver or a, some sort of traffic cop or whatever. And you get given all the toys, all the equipment, and you get carte blanche, go up there and get the bad guy. But along with that comes the invisible rucksack with death and destruction, pain, anger and upset that you carry around with you all the time. You can't see it. Other people can't see it, but it's there, and it's there on my shoulders. And every Bobby in the world carries one of these rucksacks. What did I do? Um, my job, basically, is to go to work every day, be debriefed, and then get given a fast car to go out and catch burglars, car thieves, and criminals. Um, I'm highly trained, or I was highly trained, and I specialised in what I did. Okay. You'd come into work, you'd have a quick brew, warm yourself up as you would do normally, any job, and then you'd be debriefed what's gone on the night before, what vehicles have been stolen, what routes they've gone, what number of plates have been stolen in the area, and any intelligence you can build on. And this is separate to the intelligence that you already know. You was a cop for 19 years, my boy. I, hey, listen, no pause, but you, you look nice. Hey, you look youthful for your age is what I'm trying to say. 
itself about what's local. So just say, for instance, you might have two or three burgling crews around, one in, one in Bradford, one in Halifax, and one in Leeds. Most of them know the same ways or where they're going to be going, how they're going to be getting home. So our job is to look at information we've got, assess it, and think if something comes in, a certain type of car which is linked to a certain crew, we roughly know where that car is going to be going back. We also know what's stolen at the time and what number plates are being currently being used. So with all this intel, we can normally drop on something at right time, right there. When we come on and we turn out... Hey, hit that like button. Hit that like button, y'all. Stop it. Come on. Hit the like button. We're subject at radio to 999 calls. Those calls then um, send us where we need to go for our TCs. If some, a robbery is coming, an armed robbery, a stolen vehicle or something like that, that's where we get sent to. But when we're not listening to the radio, we, we go playing, basically. I retired because the amount of playing I did built up and built up and built up. The and amount of no what? release for what we're playing I did. I retired because the amount of playing I did Plan? built up and built up and built up and I had no release for what we're doing in general. Certain things happened to me um, at work and in my private life that if you want to put it where there's stones in a glass or pebbles in a private life. At work and in your private life. My life, my question is be real, man. Be real. Be real. Tell me the truth, bro. Because I, I believe this, and I believe this wholeheartedly, that police officers bring their private lives to work and cannot and, and, and use their, that job as a release instead of dealing with their private lives privately. They come to work and they take it out on... I believe that. I could be wrong. We're having a conversation here. Let me know. <laughs> that, if you want to put it where there's stones in a glass or pebbles in a okay. glass the pebbles have overfilled the water and I, I just had a breakdown at work I suffer now um, and I've been told that I'll probably suffer all my life but I'll have coping mechanisms how to deal with things that I deal with the reason I'm doing these podcasts or these videos so to speak is so people can understand first of all if you have got any sort of illness or mental illness you shouldn't ever be afraid you shouldn't ever be scared of speaking out Agreed. So what? You've got you've got an illness. Does it really matter? You're still you. You're still the person you were born. You're still the person you're going to be. It's a speed bumping road. It's, it's a glitch. It's just something that's happening to you right now. But if you if you let it consume you, it's going to consume you. But if you speak out, if you stand up and say, "Look, I'm poorly. There's something wrong." You can deal with it. And how you deal with it is how you ever you want to deal with mine. Agreed. Agreed. But there are now now. There are incorrect ways of dealing with it, but but agree for the most part. Dealing is about you can deal with it, and how you deal with it is how you ever you want to deal with it. My dealing is about standing and saying now I can talk about it. I want to talk about it. I want to, I want to voice what's upset me, voice what's made me angry, and voice what's destroyed me. And I hope that when people are listening to this or watching this, they can sort of like have the same feelings. Oh, that's not right. I I feel like that too. Uh, yeah, I, I've, I I hope a lot of current cops, current police officers can watch this and learn how to vent now. Because like I said earlier, I really wholeheartedly believe what I just said. And I feel like the way this is going, I feel like if current officers watch this, they can really learn how to, you know what I'm saying, separate what's going on personal. And, you know, I don't, okay, let me just... I understand that because I understand where it's coming from. I, I feel like that too. Uh, yeah, I, I've, I understand that because I understand where it's coming from. And the only way I can bring that out myself is by telling myself about what I've done in the past. And I can either look for feelings or look for positives, look for negatives, and I can build on them then. So if you go back to my duty then at work, I'm going out in my traffic car every single day with this rucksack on my back, carrying invisible stones, and it's first of all, if you can split this into two, I'm going to talk about work, but if you've got a rucksack now, think about how many stones yours have got in while I tell my stories. Think about what it's going to make you achieve and not achieve. Think about where you want to go with it. And if you're pretending you haven't got a rucksack, now's the time for you to turn around and say, I've got a rucksack. This is my rucksack and this is what it's filled with. Like living in some of the areas, the harder areas, some people don't have a choice. Some people don't have a choice 
they get a rucksack because they <laughs> because the cards that, that were bid that the, the cards that were dealt to them and they didn't even know they were playing. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So when I was going out on patrol, I was going out with this rucksack and I was trying to hide it in the car. I was trying to pretend it didn't exist in the time. I pretended that I was someone I wasn't. So when people look back and go, oh, I've watched you on TV, I've watched you and you're quite humorous, are you quite this and quite that? Well, I suppose I was, but I think I was being me. Have we, we've seen an episode with him on there, haven't we? Me, pretending to be a police officer and a traffic cop. I wasn't a traffic cop pretending to be normal. So everything I do, I wear with my heart on my sleeve. And if you say something, it upsets me, I'll tell you that it's upset me. So I would go into so many jobs that I just couldn't pretend or lie to myself anymore. And there's nothing wrong, there's nothing hurting me, there's nothing upsetting me. When you get in a car and you go out, it's a bizarre concept, not knowing what you're going to that day. You might kiss your kids goodbye on the doorstep at two in the afternoon, and by four o'clock you might be laying in an hospital bed with a severe injury. You might not come home. You might be run over, you might have a broken arm. You don't know what you're gonna be dealing with or what's gonna come your way. You've also got to accept that you're gonna be seeing and doing things that people shouldn't ever see and shouldn't ever do. You're gonna have images that are gonna massively affect you. But again... Let's keep in mind, keep in mind, keep in mind. I, I just wanna say this though, this is a choice though, right? Or did you sign, did you, okay, did you, when you, when you signed up to be a police officer, did you, like, really not know what you were signing up for, really not know, really not go in knowing, hey, this is a possibility, this is life-altering, like, these are things that might change my everyday outlook on stuff, like, you know what I'm saying? That choice was, you know what I'm saying? Like, give me. Again, it's how we deal with those images. I was having to sweep their kids up off floor in theory and then go home two hours later and play with my children. And I couldn't put a line between them both. Okay. I would play with my children, but I would come in desensitized where I didn't feel love. I didn't feel Ooh. support. I didn't feel like I belonged anywhere. Okay. And this all escalated more when he couldn't draw the line between the two. And we got filmed for police interceptors. Salute, my boy. And when we got filmed for police interceptors. Because what I were having to do then, I were having to lie even further to be someone else that I'm not. Not only lie to be a police officer, but then lie to be somebody else on TV. Because you're bringing a certain entertainment value to it as well, right? Unconsciously, even if you didn't want to, you still did it. Um, <clears throat> the show itself was brilliant. I loved it. I loved the director. I loved the camera staff. I loved everyone. And it gave us a, um, a new zest for what we're doing because people wanted to see what you did as a job, wanted to see your work, wanted to see these... Hey, shout out to Ben, man, because this, this, t I'm, hey, listen, I'm going to be frank. I'm going to be real rap raw and how I feel what you're saying. And, 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 and for, to even put yourself out here like this, you know, telling your story, I commend that. And then when people like me that come along and react to it, and then you probably see it, you might see it, you might don't. But when you do see it, like this level of, I wouldn't say judgment, but like this level of, like I have my certain things with the police. Uh, let me hear it anyway, let me buy it. Pursuits, these bad men get wrestled to the floor. But every time you left work and went home then, you had not only your pretend rucksack, but you had an image to live up to. And you can't always do that. You know yourself if you're, if you're trying to be someone you're not, there's only so much pretend you can do before it's the lie burns itself out, so to speak. And we, it becomes too emotional, you get become too drawn in.
So I want people to listen to my mistakes. I want people to listen to where I've gone wrong. Okay. I want people to. I want people to understand that being poorly isn't a choice, but what you do about it. Understand that being poorly isn't a choice. Being what? what? You, I want people to understand that being poorly isn't a choice, okay. but what you do about it is the choice. So. I first realised there was something wrong when I was getting so lethargic. I were at work and I'd, I'd, I think I'd had 12 hours sleep. I'd get to work, I'd be walking up steps. And I was just so tired. It was so emotionally tired of going to work. And I was so down and... Where did y'all feel this? An airplane hanger? Like, what is that? No way. Pissed off. It just felt like every day was just getting darker and darker and darker. Swear to God, that's how I felt living in Chicago. Right hand to, 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 to the, on the Bible. I loved Chicago. I loved it with all my heart. It was the funnest place, but like it was a dark cloud over me. Every day I wake up like, oh my God, I'm still. Like I, like I did, like I felt like, like this is what I felt. <laughs> I knew I was off my diet. I knew I wasn't eating right. That's one of the main things. You're lethargic, you're not eating right. You've got to understand where it comes from. They always say if you put good food in your belly, it gives good hormones or it gives good nutrition, which gives good brain activity in. Then you want to work out and so on. And this cycle goes on. I was eating, but it wasn't what I was supposed to be eating. It wasn't junk food, but it was just I wasn't eating right on my diet were off. I was getting tired. And then I realised that my 12 hours night were actually three, maybe four hours a night sleep. And it, every night, it will withdrawing and getting less and less and less. It were only getting... Uh, the worst time, I would have done do two hours. And I think ah, I did three, three hours for the best part of 12 months. I was just a shell of what I was, but I was burning that energy, burning that candle at both sides to try and keep forward, try and keep myself going all the time. And we just had as uh, as son... Um, He's four now, he's a right little cheeky lad. Brilliant. Um, Salute. I didn't feel out, I didn't feel any emotion. I didn't feel any, I couldn't give out. And the reason being is every time I, I was trying to give something, I thought I was gonna hurt him. And I don't mean hurt him as in, I'm out to hurt someone. I thought I was gonna drop him. I thought I was gonna overfeed him. I thought when I put him to bed, I put blanket on him when he were wrapped in his baby wrap that, for somehow I'd smother him. Um, and it were a horrible feeling, but the way it's been told back to me is you're not scared you're going to do something, you're just scared about mortality. And you're scared someone's going to go, that's really close to you. And you're trying to prepare yourself for that. So if you can just take you back a right little bit. I mean, that's crazy, because I, 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 I uh, locked away my feelings a long time ago. So, so like... Living in Chicago, plus not feeling real, no, really no emotion. Always hoping for, the, not hoping for, but always expecting the worst. And if it was better than the worst, that's my mentality. Or it was. Um, can't remember exact dates. But in 2000 and, I think about 2017, I think it was. Um, New Year's Eve. Run my dad and says, uh, Happy New Year, hope you have a good crack, you know what I mean? Speak to you tomorrow. So we, we had all them, and then New Year's Day, I phoned him about 10 in the morning, and I said, uh, Happy New Year, how are you doing? Oh, yeah, I'm, I'm good, thanks. So now, just let you know, we took your mum into hospital. I said, Wow, well, what's wrong? She said, uh, Something wrong with her tummy. I can't remember what it was, but something wrong with her tummy. So, all right, where is she now? Oh, she's in Airedale, they're going to operate on her today. All right, let me know how it goes. It's going to be all right. Spoke to him, I think it was a six hour operation. Six hours later, she got out of the hospital and they put her on a high dependency ward, uh, which isn't intensive care, it's just a bit under. And it turned out <clears throat> her stomach had burst through at night from an ulcer and it poisoned her. Wow. So she was awake, she went awake, she went awake. And it got to a point where they had to ventilate her. So they ventilated her. And coming from a police officer's background, I know when someone ventilates, or is at that point of being ventilated, it's quite bad because the machines are having to breathe from. Got to day nine or 10 and she came off the ventilator, which were all good. 
went to see her that night, sat up talking to me, just like how I'm talking to you now. Um, and she said some things. Uh, and it was just a strange, strange time, really. Went home. Next morning, I were on early, got up, went to work. Just in the office, as I said, getting a cup of tea, getting my kit on, phone rings. So we're in the office, prepared to go out with my invisible rucksack and crack on. Phone rings, it's my dad. Head of hospital, the call is in. Your mum's on a um, intensive care unit and um, <clears throat> they want us in now. I got blue lighted over. Um, and when I got there, my dad were there and my brother, and they took us into a room and basically said they were gone that night, but they were keeping her alive for us. They've outlined that, the machine's keeping her alive, which I know that. And if it were their mum, they'd let her go. Now, you try and deal with that from your mother's point of view, knowing that seven to eight hours earlier, you were sat talking to her. So I know in myself, for all the RTCs I've ever been, we've been dealt with, that she died. She'd crashed in night, they ventilated her, they got her heart going, and they were just pumping her through everything they could do just to keep her there so we could say bye to her. My dad, proper Yorkshire man, builder, Tyler, kind of didn't settle for any crap. He just couldn't understand what the dots were saying. So I identified the doctor of what I did as a job and could you give us a few minutes? So I explained to my dad, we need to turn mum off. When you're talking to your dad about his partner that he's been with for about 40 years, that's an hard decision to make. And when I've got to tell my dad, you need to turn your mum off. Uh, my condolences, man, that's a, hard, that's a hard one right there, that's tough. It hurts because you're taking responsibility for what goes on. <clears throat> we went round into Bay, all Bay's segregated. She's laid there, tube ventilated, and we all say goodbye to her. And I kneel down, I kiss her head, and then I look at the doctor and I, I nod to the doctor and the doctor pulls plug. Within 20 seconds, mum's flat line and she's gone. I made the decision to kill my mum in theory, to turn my mum's life support. It was my decision, I nodded. It's a rough word to use. I've got to live with that. My backpack were there at side of me. And that guilt and that feeling I've put in my backpack. Put my backpack on my shoulder and I've cracked on. That's what people don't see, they don't see that thing you're dealing with all times. I've got all these fatals, all these other people's parents that have died, all these other children that have died. I'm carrying them around in this backpack. I'm now carrying the fact that I've just switched my mum's off. That's, that's the roughest one of them all. That's tough. We try and deal with it the best way we know how. How do you deal with it when your mum's gone? It's, it's a bizarre concept. We let dad have some time off. If that makes that's the bad thing to say is that. No, it's not. It makes sense. Dad can't cope with it, so dad asks us to deal with the funeral part. So we ask dad what he wants song wise, but then we organise all the funeral. I think it just knocked him for six, really. Um, Leighton, my brother, my older brother, he just stepped it up. He just become that person there that you go to. It's, this is my job. I'm I'm the police officer. I'm the one that deals with all the all the shit. I'm the one that deals with all the hate and pain. And I just didn't, I just, I didn't caffle, but I just, my backpack was getting too heavy. And for me, it felt like things were shutting down. Um, and to deal with the loss of your mum. A lot of this is just how men move as well. Like men in general, I don't want to disclude, I don't want to make it a woman male thing, but men in the world, we're taught to just push things to the back and never really fully deal with them. You know what I'm saying? We're taught to not show emotions. 
emotions are weak. We're taught uh, uh, just get it done. And that is that's true, but to a certain extent, man, when things are getting ready to bubble over, you got to talk about it. I don't care what nobody say, man. I don't care what nobody say. Because that when it when it bubbles, it, certain people, when it bubbles too far, something bad comes out of that. Something really bad and terrible comes out of that. Now, out of a scale of 1 to 10, how close were I to my mum? Well, she's your mum, isn't she? She's, she's always been there. She always looked after you. But I'm close to my dad. My dad was my best friend. My mum was my mum. My dad was my best friend. <clears throat> I remember him saying as we got to the funeral, we can do this, we can, let's go do it, let's, we sat in car. My bad. It got so bad for me in Chicago, I stopped going to funerals. It didn't matter who it was, I didn't go to the funeral. It was blocking it all out. Let's go do it. And it's bizarre, she went into crematorium with Elvis playing. She really liked Elvis. She went in with Elvis playing. And I never knew how heavy my bag was getting at the time. And it starts to the point when I should have turned around and says, I'm struggling to pick this bag up here. And I didn't, and this is what people need to understand about mental health. If you find yourself having a wobble, or you find yourself shaking, or something's beginning to get you a little bit, you just need to start thinking, right, I've got something wrong, there's an issue. And I never picked that issue up. I carried this bag around with me for ages. I had about two weeks off. Um, can't remember about, yeah, about two weeks off work. I want to tell you about this job. You know, this, <clears throat> this job is the job that's broke me as a person. Um, this is the job where I gave too much myself. Uh, so I do apologise if I get a bit upset. But the first day back after my mum's funeral, um, I was on duty but I wasn't with my team, I was with another team, with an acting sergeant. And I got told to hide. Basically, come on, Joey, they know what had gone on, first day back, can you go and hide? So I said, yeah, I'm going to hide. And I drove out of the Nick, and I went to my area, the area I patrol, the area that I'm comfortable in, and I reversed into a car park, and I just switched off. Oh, to hide, okay. Looked at some photos of my mum, looked at some photos of my dad, to try to get back into the uniform stage of being active and being there. And what happens is when you're in a traffic car, people look at you. So everyone is he doing speed checks, he's doing and everything getting used to that focus of attention. And his call comes out on radio, um, extra Romeo one two. So I didn't answer it. Extra Romeo one two. So extra Romeo one two. Yeah, one, two, go ahead. We've got a knockdown shrunk corner, can you go? It's a child knockdown. How would you feel if it were your child and you knew it was a police car 200 metres away? Would you want me to go? Doesn't matter about my feelings, doesn't matter about what I'm going through. Do you want me to go? If it my kid, I want you to go. So I've got to suck it up and I've got to go. I'm shouting at the steering wheel, fucking leave me alone, leave me alone. I don't want to go, I don't want... Get back on radio. Yeah, I'll go. Calm voice. Well, other units are on. Was, okay, I, I get everything, but was not, so you was off for two weeks, was not, okay, okay, I get what you was going through. Your rucksack was full. As a man, you got to just push through it. Your time was up. Let's get back to work. So that makes everything that I was about to say irrelevant. Well, I just talked it out like that. But I was gonna say, um, did, was the option not on the table to take more time off? On the way, they're on the way to you now, but they're just too far to get there within the immediate time because you've got to get there within 15 minutes. I set off and we're driving while like dog shit, it were horrendous. I just didn't know what we're doing. I just didn't know how to drive a car. I had just so much going on in my plate. Come out of the car park, turn left, now not the road. And I'm just turning right. And this is turn right. There's a funnel of cars. So there's like, once you enter this funnel of cars, there's no way you're going to turn around. And it's the end of these cars, radio bleeps. 
Akshay Ramya won't see where Jin. Forgot to turn on my uh ad block. Oh, don't go. It's chow. Radio bleeps. Akshay Ramya won't see where Jin. Don't go. Don't go. It's chow fatal. Which that basically means the, the, the child who's involved is dead. Dead. So come around the corner to the scene, there's a 44 articulated to lorry, to my right hand side. The truck? The driver just, there's, there's nothing on his face, he's just, he's gone, he's, he's broken. I skid my car to a stop. Code six on the radio, which basically means I'm, I'm at the scene. I get out of the car and I can hear this, thank fuck, police are here, traffic are here, it's all all right. Got to the back of my car, get my traffic folder out, which has got all my documents in, it's got my paper in, so I can start talking, getting sketch plans, getting everything I need to be doing, start updating the radio, start dealing with this, that, and other. There's a little damp road, there's a little buoyant road. There's a little damp road, there's a little buoyant road. Two year old. Oh. And his head's being run over by a truck. Oh. Two year old, and his head's being run over by a truck. And he's laid there in his little Converse shoes. That's crazy. Because I have a two year old. That's why I do not take my eye off her. And I get mad when she takes her hands when we're by the streets or we're by outside. I get very upset when, she, when I'm holding her hand and she snatches it from me. And that's when I just got to pick her up, let her cry. I don't care. See, this is, man, this is going to make me even worse. And his, his hands are pointing upwards, which matches his little Converse shoes. And his, his hands are pointing upwards, which my daughters do when she sleeps. I start making way down to this little lad. And um, I get about 30 feet away. It's like I'm walking through blue my legs are getting heavier and heavier and heavier and I'm sinking there's pain in my chest he's pulling me back towards the car but I'm see it feels like I'm sinking into the floor it feels this pain is I can't describe it. this pain is like it's killing it's crushing me it's it's crushing me into the floor that's all I can describe it this is the worst <laughs> this is the worst thing I've ever heard <laughs> Like his whole mom, everything else that was going, his rucksack full. Mom just gone. And this first day back? And I just stand there and I can feel cold wind on my face. And the only way I can describe it is having a, an elastic band from there to there, pulled as tight as it can, and it snaps. And I felt it go. I remember the exact second I felt it go, and it snaps. And I just stood there and I started crying. I started crying in front of all witnesses, all people. I started crying and I got on radio and I just said, I can't, I need help. I need assistance, I need help. It's a fail. I think they understood. I think they, they knew, all the ACR, the control operators knew what we're going through. I turned around these X5 skids up to our firearms cops called, um, excuse me, called the, the, the TAC Med. So they're like paramedic level and they, they've got all the kit, proper paramedic kit. And I said, don't go down with this, this, para, this uh, firearms lady. I said, don't go down. So she runs off down the road with this, all this kit on. She comes up within 30 seconds and she's just bleeding with tears. Can't, can't stop crying. I can't remember, I think I said, now when I'm talking about it, it's hard. But I had my backpack and there were no room for this thing to go in. Does that make sense? There's no room.
That's rough. That's crazy. Oh, yeah, you got me, my boy. I got kids. I can't take this type of stuff. This is going to hit me different. Anything else? Room for me to push the cinema. It's gone. Something's gone inside. I think I covered him up. I think I put my jacket over him and covered him up. I just didn't want anyone seeing him. I just didn't want anyone touching him. And I remember someone putting their hand on my shoulder and just saying, it's all right, come on, let's go. And by that time, it was swollen with bobbies. There were officers everywhere. Paramedic, I think air ambulance came. And then they just removed me from scene. They took me back to the Nick and they sat me in an office with no one there. There was no one to cuddle me, there was no one to put their arm around me. There was no one to tell me we were going to be all right. There was nothing. I, was... I should have watched Benadorn first. This just took the joy out of Benadorn for me. I told her to do some paperwork. Just do paperwork for a job. It broke me. It broke. It broke who I was as a person. It broke who I was as an officer. And I've never been the same since. Where am I going to put this thing that can't go in the backpack? What do I do with it? So now I've got a backpack and I'm carrying this under my arm. It wasn't little lad's fault, he didn't. But what about truck driver? What about him? What about all the bobbies that were there? What about all them? It's not just me, it's all of them. Even That's the point when I should have said. I couldn't even imagine, bro. I'm watching through a screen the story of the story, and that got me. That got me. Boy, that got me. When you got kids, it's it, you. When you got kids and you hear stuff like this, it's like you try not to imagine it. You try not to put yourself in a situation, but like it. Can't help it, like, damn, like, nah, yeah, yeah, nah. I'm done. That's the point where I should have said I can't do this anymore. But I didn't. I just carried it around with me all the time. I came to work the next day at the same time, normal time. Walked in the office, smile on my face, but I was dying. I was dying inside. I wanted someone to say, I can take this off you. I can take that off you. You can put it down. But I didn't realise, you don't realise you're poorly. You don't realise that. You're not well enough to deal. There's signs you should be looking out for. My diet were one of them, the lethargicness, the lack of sleep. Uh, it, man, you had a lot going on. And and what the thing is, he didn't really bring it, he brought it to work, he brought the rucksack, but like, it don't sound like he took it out on nobody, he just took it out on himself, it just erupted. It was rough. And this is when I got home, and I've got a little girl to play with. See? And I've got to go to my little girl and cuddle my little girl and kiss my little girl. When that person doesn't have that little, little, little boy anymore. You've got to take whatever you can out of life. And you've got to take it for what it is. Is there some big plan? Is, is that when he's meant to go? Is that what someone higher up deemed? That's that his time? Got to try and enjoy my family life, but I've just buried my mum. So it feels like I've got nothing. I can't give anyone anything else. There's members of public ringing 999, I need you. Why have I got to give myself to you now? What about me? Who's going to deal with me? Who's going to look after me? My family need me, and I'm not good enough to deal with my family. You need to accept that when you're poorly, it's all right to shout up, because I never shouted up, and now look at me. I cry constantly. And I cry about things that I can't change. But what I should have changed is the fact that 
anyone can fall, anyone can be ill. And if you've got a mental illness, don't hide it away because I did and it gets you nowhere. It gets you nothing. So all I want for people to take away from this, listening to it and watching or whatever they're doing is, I'll do that now. I'll reach out, I'll ring my doctor, I'll ring my mum, I'll ring my dad, I'll ring my friend. I'll put my backpack down and ask for someone to help me empty it. I'll put them on, put them on the shelves where they need to go. Do you know what I mean? I might open them occasionally, but at least I know where they are. I'll even go to a shop and buy another backpack and carry some more around with me. But I suppose that's what I want. I want people to... I feel like uh, we compartmentalize and everything. Sometimes we just got to, you know, put it out there, man, letting people know. You didn't got to let people know. Just let somebody know. Talk to it. Get it off your chest is what he said. I feel like... To acknowledge we've got a problem. You don't want people to say, I'm struggling and it's all right. Or well, mommy's. Spot it. It's tough. See, I love leave a like, comment, subscribe. I'm done.